<laughs> welcome, welcome to a, another Sunday Scoops on this Sunday afternoon. Again, my name is Big G, and right beside me is the man himself. Richie Blackford. I will tell you. I will tell you. I will tell you. <laughs> and uh, today, Joe, Joe Gibbs. Joel. In fact, he was born Joel Gibson in 1943 in a little place called Salt Spring, just outside of Montego Bay in St. James. And yeah. um, Joe Gibbs, as he, be, as he came to be known, was a slouch as far as his contribution to the music is concerned. He was an electronic engineer. Yes, apparently he went to Guantanamo Bay. He went to the United States initially and then got on a program that sent him to Guantanamo well, Bay. Back in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, Richard, a lot of Jamaicans went over to Guantanamo Bay. To because work. it was, the, the, the place had... Just, well, 59, the place yeah. had started shifting. And the next best thing is for farm work. You trust yeah. me. You prefer but, to go. Go on to my beard and go farm work. <laughs> <laughs> but but he, he became an elect He worked as an electrician, electronics technician in Guantanamo Bay and then came back to Jamaica in, in the early 60s where he decided to set up, put out his shingle as an electrician, open up a little elect ele electronics repair shop you know, little, little fixed radio. True um, bumps. You know, um, you, if you had, had the opportunity with a tube amps and thing. And a you tube know, in a tube. Yeah, yeah, you can't say tube. <laughs> it is called a tube amps. You know, in those days, you go you go a dance, you see a little man like, like lean up side of the set and then pack it, bulge out or some extra tube in my Just anything, in case one of them get blown. Blow him, just <laughs> fix it on the spot. So, but but Joe, Joel Gibson was one of those electricians, and um, by 19, well, he opened a little shop at Beeston Street. You know, Beeston Street. That, um, yeah, my old man used to live at Beeston Street and Simit Lane. You know, Simit Lane. Simit Lane, yes. Yeah, not Smith Lane, you know, Simit Lane. Simit Lane, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, he he opened a little shop down at Beeston Street, and then um, in time, the, because the music thing started. Um, pick up and he started selling records um, uh, you know of course as the natural progression of things he would have gotten into the music business you know what you know what is what is amazing God in those in those times is the 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 way these guys were quick to spot an opportunity you yeah. know mm -hmm. and and not only just spot the opportunity but to capitalize on it um, he started selling records at his place, and um, within in time, he started to look around for talent. I think he knocked it with your 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 boy Bonnie Lee. Yes. Um, uh, you know, Bonnie Lee was one of the, the, the one of the well, Bonnie biggest Lee was like a producer. producer. But <laughs> he was a briefcase producer, right? Or a yes. paperback producer. I didn't tell him a briefcase. He had a a a grace super strong tech shopping bag and that yes. briefcase and him go from studio to studio recording yes. studio them days it was federal i think he did a little work at at coxon's place as well but most of the recording was being done at federal records mm -hmm. and um they they of course the business throw people like a yeah, well, we know all of the big artists them coming out at them time. Slim, si Slim Simit or Slim Smith. Slim Smith. And um, Delroy Wilson. Delroy Wilson, Roy Shirley. Yes. Who, in fact, um, Gibson's earliest recording was done with Roy Shirley, which I'm pretty sure you're going to... 1967. Yeah, man, we have that lineup long time. Let's, so give, let's give a taste. Let's give a taste. Right. Taste of Hold Them. The, 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 the song. Um, Roy Shirley... This was a big hit for him in Jamaica. And um, I think Joe Gibbs, according to the scribes, used his connections with, with um, Bonnie Lee, who basically knew his way around the place. And I think by the time RJR had kind of started shifting into, you know, as a commercial radio station, was becoming a little bit more attuned to the mu music that was coming out. And um, I think Bonnie connected with Jeff Barnes at the time mm -hmm. and um but that that helped them push the tune it was a it was a staple on the radio as you said earlier you know everybody know 
every single line of this song. And I think, um, you know, because this song was so popular, there was a, a point at which Roy Shirley did a couple of variations of the song. In fact, he even, he even did a festival song yes. with the same beat. Yes, yes. Just to give you an, an indication. The song also, they Listen, took it. If it ain't broke, no, fix it. No, I, I, you can't blame him for that at all. He also, the song was also released in England on um, Graham Goodall's, the, the Dr. Bird label. And if you know much about the thing, uh, there was a Dr. Bird um, club in, in the Clock Tower Plaza in Half a Tree where he used to have the Dr. Bird uh, Music Awards and so on. So just, you know, just taking listeners back a little bit there. He, um, Bonnie Lee also introduced, introduced um, to Joe, Gib Joe Gibbs, a man, a little young boy, um, Errol Dunkley. And Errol Dunkley, when he, when, in, on his meeting with Joe Gibbs, Gibbs gave him some records, some R&B tunes that he had brought back with him from the States and um, tell him to, you know, study the, the, the songs and thing. Well, Dunkley came and he did his earliest recording with Joe Gibbs. And I'm pretty sure you have that lined up on the turntable. Please God. stop your lying, girl. There you go. So a long time man have woman problem now, Richard. Long time, man, <laughs> 60s. <laughs> Let's give a listen to Errol Dunkley and his, his, um, his first, first recording. Outing. Please stop your lying, girl. Yes. Why, well, I've just been schooled and I'm not, I'm not afraid for say when me wrong. I played the wrong long shot song because I printed yeah. there's 12 of them you have. Yeah, long uh, shot, kick the yeah, bucket. Long shot, bust the bed. done with right. uh, Beverly's and, and so I'm not afraid for tech schooling because that's how you learn. Well, you don't know? wrong with that. That's what? why we work. That's why we do this thing together. You know, think. There you go. There you go. Uh, these guys think about is gambling and food. Yeah, but you can't blame them, God. In them days, you Listen, know, you remember Saturday, the 1960s. From then till now. Yeah. On a Saturday afternoon, you go to any betting shop, trust me. No, it's not even Saturday afternoon. It used to start from early in the morning. Because you used to have English racing. You oh, see? yes. English racing start from 7 um, o'clock in the morning. Call, what do I call it? The down, London Downs or we, something like that? Churchill Downs. Yeah, Churchill a couple Downs. Of, couple of racetracks. And especially when you have things like steeplechase and all them things. But you, betting shop open from early in the morning. It's particularly on a Saturday. Yeah, when Miss Maisie can't find her husband. <laughs> you should know if you go up a betting shop and him gamble out the pay where him get last night. Right? And then by the time English racing closed off by midday. And came on a, came on a spark. Came on a spark. <laughs> came on a spark racing open up now. And, that, and then all of the real gambling go on. Because most men get a little prips from the jockey, you know. Buy, buy number the, six the in the race. Or right? the trainer. No, the, the trainer and a run thing, you know, a jockey right, run, so the, run the uh, track. Uh, them, the jockey uh, carry the battery. Kind of thing. <laughs> and, and not only that, they make arrangements with each other who going to win. And they bet, cross betting and all them things. But that was the, uh, the, the feature of the period. Remember to 1960s, you know, the whole for television. I think by that time, um, JBC must have just started to try a thing with TV, sign on both. About six o'clock in the evening, and by ten o'clock, it's sign off back again. Mm -hmm. I don't know all the programming, but um, the, that was the, the the a feature of the period. Now, the long shot race, long shot bus bed, long shot was what you call a a journeyman horse. Occasionally, he win, but him always in the frame. You know, if mm -hmm. if they if no win second and third, so you can not always buy a perm bet, which include long shot. Right? A perm bet is he might come second or you can or mix it place. up with somebody, win and place. Or, you know, you buy a long shot for win or place. And if him come second or third, you get a little something for your money. So long shot was one of them journeyman ass. And then this particular day, long shot run out of the frame and every man, you have some man <laughs> buy all some round the clock bet, you know, with eight ass in the, in, in, the bet. And how them buy the bet is that they put long shot as a horse so they know must place. So if long shot no place and all of the other horse them come in, the bet they're dead. And long shot 
this time never come first, second, nor third. Longshot finished way down the frame. But outside of that, Longshot was a horse uh, so running some 200 and odd races that came on a spark. I think he ran 203 races at Cayman Spark and he w finished within the frame in about 90% of them. So I think it was a, a GRA F class horse if I remember correctly. And then what happened now, the, the song he played earlier, which was actually done by the pioneers for um, Kong at Beverly's, was when Longshot dropped down and dead from the track. Longshot a run <laughs> his final race, his 200 run out. race, and then he come round the corner. What uh, the horse in front, the horse that was in front, fell down. I hear him say, um, whatever the horse name fell, and then long shot fell and broke him neck. <laughs> that, that was it. Wow. So, but that was the story with with long shot. Again, the pioneers made a a big. Well, those those songs were a big part of what enhanced their careers uh, to the extent that those, those records, they, they, they were able to tour on those records, went to England, in fact, and um, you know, established themselves as, as a, a, a significant um, group. In fact, when they were doing the recording at, at um, Joe Gibbs, the first record, Longshot, Boss Me Bet, it was only two of them, and they, 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 they needed a third guy as to sort of harmonize and they found this like a youngster who was sitting outside of the studio and he said, you can't sing? And he said, yes boss, we can't sing man. He said, well, me, me, <laughs> sing, let me hear you. And the youth must have bust a little tune and I can't remember his name now, but they brought him into the group and he became the third. But before the show is out, I'll tell you, we'll remind what his name, his name was. But that is um, Joe Gibbs getting started. Now, he also had in his camp, Lee scratched Perry. Perry had just recently had a falling out with Coxon, who he had literally grown up with Coxon. He started out as a box man, carried the, the sound system box, hook up the sound, run the wires and things, and then eventually he started to help out in the studio. But Coxon wouldn't, A, pay them enough money, and you know, him and Coxon fall out. Plus he felt himself to be a singer, and that he had, you know, a better ability to contribute to the, the music, but Coxon wouldn't give him a break. And so he cut off Coxon and leave. And he joined um, Joe Gibbs. And of course, he was sort of a kind of a talent spotter for, 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 for Joe Gibbs, in as, in as much as he fancied himself as a singer and put out a couple of tunes. Um, in fact, he, he put out a tune that was kind of directed at um at Cox and Dad, a tune called I Am the Upsetter. And um the the you know things went well for a while and then um of course himself and Joe Gibbs again fell out. Fell out. And him say it's like a marriage, you know, if a man married more than one, more than two times. Right? And in my third marriage, and the wife had a problem in her. Most you, because you are the <laughs> common element in the equation. And so, <laughs> the fact that Perry seemed to be all over the place with everybody. Thing. But anyway, he, um, he did some work with, with um, Joe Gibbs, and again, as I said, they fell out over money. And he, parted when he, 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 he part, they parted ways, and um, he put out a tune, which was really a, a jab. It was one Gibbs. of the first, what you call, tracing tune. A tune <laughs> called People Funny Boy. And of course, Joe Gibbs answered him back with a tune called People, People Grudgeful, Grudgeful Boy. And those tunes, as I said, started the, the, the kind of back and forth tracing between artists and whatever. And I'm pretty That's sure so, yeah. you can give us a little taste. Give us a little taste of I Am The Upset of because we're coming up on a break and then I'll play People Funny Boy and then People Grudgeful. <laughs> Get a beat. I forget a beat, man. The man say you fatten up the music and well, make it sound well, well, wicked. The man answer him one marga dog. Shown it once bitten, twice shy. <laughs> you, you know what is interesting about those, those three selections you played, oh God, is that once bitten was essentially 
Peter Tosh leaving, um, you know, on reflection. Because when, when they left, um, when the whalers left Coxon, mm -hmm. this was, the, the tune was originally done, Margadag was originally done by the whalers. And, and Tosh revisited it. So it was kind of... This was a hit, though. The, yeah, this the, 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 the departure from, from, um, from Coxon. But when he went to Joe Gibbs and redid it, and as Magic said earlier, Joe Gibbs kind of fattened up the rhythm and thing, and, you know, the, the song so nice. So they started out well, Peter Tosh and Joe Gibbs, because Peter was now in the throes of pursuing his own solo career. And they... He released a lot of tunes with, with, um, with Joe Gibbs at the time. But I guess the same malady that affected all the producers in the record business in Jamaica from... from Jump Street. Absolutely. <laughs> you, you know, Coxon, all of them. Even Prince Buster, who had left, same kind of situation. The artists and them started to fall out. And this is after um, Gibbs had produced a number of big tunes um, with Peter Tosh and money problem and Peter Tosh decided to walk. And of course, the once bitten, twice shy tune. Um, Marga Dog was kind of a throw back at, at Coxon, <clears throat> but once bitten was the him saying, it happened to me already at Coxon, and I'm not going to allow it to, to happen to him with, with another producer. And he would now basically go, go out and, and create his own record label. Intel Diplo, I think, was the, was the, the, the product of this um, um, experience he had with Joe Gibbs. And Joe Gibbs would have lost one of the best artists that would have come in his, in his, in his orbit. And um, again, it's just kind of nonsensical that as a producer you're making money off of the tune why not keep the the artist happy mm. but such is the this the this was the status quo in the music business at the time and of course you know the artists who knew better and peter Tosh certainly was one of those he decided to go about his business um interestingly at the time to Gibbs had formed, um, because by now he is growing. Attracting some of the top uh, 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 musicians. Know, uh, uh, attracting the top musicians. And fact, artists. They had moved the studio from downtown because they had kind of they had changed the address from Beeston Street, um, moved closer to Orange Street initially, and then eventually they, um, they found a place at Retirement Road. Retirement Road was kind of developing as a sort of sub-commercial yeah, district. It's near to Brentford and, Road. Right. And they, they um, established the studio there. And at the time, to Gibbs formed an alliance with Errol Thompson, who was a, a engineer of some repute. And um, they now would take the, up the ante as far as the music was concerned. In fact, during the, with the departure of Scratch Perry, the, comes it was Nine, nine the Observer. Nine the Observer. Well, at the time it was Nine, later on yeah, they would they call him Nine the, the Observer. I think the Observer thing would have come through his association with, with Bonnie Lee. But um, Nine became the, the a &R man, if you will, and also was the man who did the, the, the studio work in terms of the arranging of the songs and so on and so forth. But didn't um, he have also a setup on uh, South Parade? It, that's what, he moved from Beeston Street to South Parade, which was kind of uh, um, just closer around the, the corner hub. from Orange Street. Yeah, closer to the hub. Right, and that, because as you go around the corner, there was Randy's over on the other side, and then you go up the road where you have... Um, Riley, the, the techniques put up their shop. Right, and then yeah, have, Prince um, Buster up the Buster road. Down the corner. And, yep, yep. And, and they go all the way up. But um, the they relationship with Errol Thompson came after they moved the studio um, from North Parade and up to, to Retirement Road. Um, should point out to. Crossroads. Right, that Joe Gibbs had also done 
um, couple of other recordings, it, it, not have any note. Um, they, they did some work with, with Eptones, but it was Peter Tosh that was the, the big one. And then the, when he formed the alliance with Errol Thompson, they called himself the Mighty Two, that now changed the way Oh, because the trajectory Thompson, of his in, business. In, absolutely, because Errol Thompson introduced his own little gymnastics within the in the studio that would change the sound, you know, f uh, to use magic magic term and say fatten up the rhythm and, and, and thing. And then um Errol Thompson introduced a couple of artists to 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 um Joe Gibbs. One of them was Dennis Emmanuel Brown, the other would have been um, you you what's her name Marcia Aiken. Um, you had Alte and Donna. Marcia Aiken did um, some work on on the what, what was the tune called? I'm still in love. It was an Alte and Ellis yeah, tune. Alte original, but right. it was remade. And, and in fact, that that Alte and Ellis tune was a source of of a copyright. Thing, infringement on the part of Gibbs, which he never learned from, and we will talk about that as you get closer. But before but you're before to your that, point. Richie, he did some some work with a uh, little gentleman, Nicky Thomas, oh, and yeah. also Eric Donald's uh, "Love of the Common People." Yes. As a matter of fact, he had both Nicky Thomas and and, and uh, Eric Donald's advice the same song, "Love of the Common People." And he released Those Eric Donald's version. And then Nicky Thomas have a little faith, and right. if I had a hammer. Those were songs that were big, big foundation songs in the early. Those are what you call jukebox songs. Jukebox songs, like, yeah. <laughs> they along with get... Marga Dog. Yeah. They were never really big on the radio, but if you listen to jukebox back in the day, that's the kind of song you're going to hear, especially this one from Eric Donaldson. Let's talk about Nicky Thomas. Well, not a bad little singer. Um, no, coming out of the, uh, again, enjoyed a reasonable, reasonable amount of success, particularly in England, because his singing style basically suited that. And it was around that time too when the music was migrating um, to the UK. So he spent a fair amount of time, did, did over, you know, as we call him, a lick over, um, mm -hmm. a, a lick over tune. But I didn't think he um, gave a, a, a bad account of himself. And, um, you know, his catalog, not big, but a lot of what you call journeyman tunes that they have done well. Eric Donaldson and um, that particular effort, after that he became, he Mr. entered festival. the festival thing. Cherry Your Baby, 1971. Cherry, right. And he basically just tore down the festival. In fact, they basically... Give him the festival crown and retire it after that because no. I think he went about forty time after that. <laughs> um, no, fresh out of out of studio one was Dennis Emmanuel Brown, ah. and um, first song was Money in My Pocket with Big Youth. That was the song, and that was with Errol Thompson was now um, the man behind the, the wheels. Yes. So let's 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 give the listeners a touch off of Money in My Pocket. <laughs> Singers and DJs, that yeah. was the last one was George Nooks and Welton Irie. Before that was uh, Roddy Thomas. Roddy Thomas and Trinity. Trinity. Yeah, so that was the combination that the Mighty Two put out, Joe Gibbs and Errol Thompson. You know, Errol Thompson and that, that, that combination, Mighty Two combination, is reportedly responsible for producing some more than 145s. Uh, so it tell you how prolific they were. Um, I think there was a series that, uh, and, and I'm pretty sure this was largely influenced by Errol Thompson. Um, they were called a African African dub series. African beat. Uh, Afri African dub. Uh, yes. Yeah. Afri we called it there were about dub. four albums. Right. Yeah. And um, the, the, the first two issues of the African dub series are, as a record collector, that is, you know, it's a must. It's a must have. It's a must have. An absolute must because have. Because it gives you a lot of the rhythms that yeah. they use. It's got African you know, dub series. African dub, dub tree, lime key rock, heavy rock, 
um, you know, and Angola crisis, Rima dub. Trust me. I'm Interestingly, and you know, I'm glad you 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 pulled out that the Rima dub Angola crisis again. This was a, a a time when the musicians were identifying with the struggle, both um, domestically and and internationally. And Yes. Because you had the, the problem with South Africa and, and, and um, Rhodesia uh, with the apartheid um, system on, on that side of the world. And here, um, there in Jamaica where... Yeah, there's even a dub called the Entebbe Affair. Absolutely. And um, if anybody remember that with Entebbe, it was the, the Israeli... Um, um, the Israelis basically attacked the Entebbe airport in, in Uganda. Um, where they Hi there. If you enjoyed that clip, go on over to our website at yardmedia.com where you can watch the entire broadcast at your leisure. And while you're there, why don't you check out our other reggae music features? And before you leave, pick up some of our Jamaican reggae merchandise and hey, don't forget to tell your friends. Garth, otherwise known as Big G. My name is Richie Blackford.